Welcome back to the Structural Dynamics course. In the last week, we have learned how dynamic analysis is different from static analysis. We learned how to formulate an equation of motion. We also learned the responses of free vibrations. We learned undamped and viscously damped free vibrations. So in this week, initially, we will solve a few example problems. After that, we will explore coulomb damped free vibrations. Later, we will learn forced vibrations. So now, let's move on to example problems. Now let's formulate the equation of motion of this system. We have a mass, a damper and a spring. A dynamic force Pt is acting on this mass. So, for this system, because of the self-rate, the system will have a static displacement. So, the displaced configuration of the system under its own weight is this. DST is the static displacement of this system. And X is the displacement of this mass relative to its static equilibrium position. XT is the total displacement of this mass. So, xt will be equal to x plus dst. Now, let's draw the free body diagram of this mass. So, a dynamic force Pt is acting downwards. Weight of the system is equal to mass times gravitational acceleration is also acting downwards. The damping force is acting upwards and it is equal to c times x dot t, the total velocity. And this, we also have a spring force which is e is equal to k times x t. So k times x plus d s t. So now we can write the total force acting on this body in vertical direction. So the unbalanced force in vertical direction is equal to Pt plus weight that is mg minus kx minus kdst minus c x dot t and this sum is equal to mass times the acceleration of this body the total acceleration. So we also know that mg that is the weight of the body is equal to k times the static displacement and we can find out from this relation that x double dot t will be equal to x double dot because dst is a static displacement this does not vary with time and also we have x dot t would be equal to x dot so we can rewrite this equation like this mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx is equal to pt so mg and minus kdst cancel out and we have this equation of motion so if you look at this equation of motion this is in terms of x and its derivative. So that means x is the displacement of this mass relative to its static equilibrium position. So if you write the equation of motion relative to the static equilibrium position, we will not have any weight term in the equation of motion. Now let's look into another system and write the equation of motion. The next system has a lumped mass m and a stiffener k. This does not have any damping and the system is affected by a ground displacement xg. The displacement of this mass relative to the support is indicated as x and the total displacement of this mass is indicated as xt. So we know that xt 
is equal to x plus xg. Now let's write the equation of motion. So if you consider this mass, there's only a spring force acting on that mass. So if x is considered positive in that direction, so the spring force will be in this direction. So it will be minus kxt. So that is the force acting on this mass and this should be equal to mass times acceleration. So that is given by Newton's law. So this is our equation of motion. We can rearrange the term. It becomes mx double dot t plus kx is equal to 0. We know that xt is x plus xt. So we can expand this term. So we have mx double dot plus kx is equal to minus m x double dot g that is the ground acceleration. So the ground displacement at the support is equivalent to having an effective dynamic force acting on this mass and the effective force is equal to minus mass times the ground acceleration. So this is how earthquake affects a structure. So earthquake is a ground acceleration or ground displacement. So that would be equivalent to having an external dynamic force on this mass and the value of that force will be equal to minus mass times ground acceleration. The next example is of torsional vibration. So we have a rigid disc of mass m mounted on a flexible shaft. So this is a rigid disc which has a mass m and it is mounted on this flexible shaft with diameter d. Neglecting the weight of the shaft and neglecting damping derive the equation of free torsional vibration of the disc. The shear modulus of rigidity of the shaft is g. So we can neglect the damping in the system and we can treat the shaft as massless. So this just offers some stiffness to the system and the disc has some mass. So this is a undamped free vibration system. So here it is torsional vibration. So let's draw the free body diagram of this disc. So so far we have been dealing with systems where the mass was lumped. It was concentrated. So this is an example where the mass is distributed. The disc has some dimensions, some radius and some thickness. So the mass will be equally distributed across this disc. So mass is distributed here. So let's go back to the free body diagram. So if theta is taken positive in this direction, we can write the restoring force. In this case, the restoring torque is equal to the torsional stiffness of this shaft multiplied by the angular displacement, that is this angle theta. So the value of this torsional stiffness of this shaft is equal to gj by l. g is the shear modulus and L is the length and J is the second moment of area. You would have learned this expressions in the mechanics of solid scores. So the restoring torque can be expressed like this. So now we can write the equation of motion using Newton's second law which says unbalanced force in this case, that is equal to the torque minus Fs. That should be equal to the inertia. So that is 
if it was a translational displacement this would have been equal to mass times translational acceleration so here this is a distributed mass and we are also talking about angular displacement so this will be the unbalanced force will be equal to angular acceleration multiplied by i naught which is the mass moment of inertia of this disk so for disk like this the mass moment of inertia is equal to m r square by 2 where r is the radius of the disk so minus fs is equal to mass moment of inertia times angular acceleration so now let's see what is the value of this torque so the torque fs is equal to gj by l that is the torsional stiffness of this shaft multiplied by the angular displacement that is theta j is the second moment of area and for this shaft it is equal to pi d to the power 4 by 32 d is the diameter of this shaft so now we can calculate this torque and the mass moment of inertia we have the pro uh, dimensions of this structure so now we can write this equation of motion as i naught theta double dot plus g j by l theta is equal to zero this is the equation of motion we can substitute the value of mass moment of inertia and the second moment of area and we get the expression for our equation of motion as this let's do one more example in this example an automobile is crudely idealized as a lumped mass m supported by a spring and a damper and this automobile travels at a constant speed v over a road which has some roughness so the roughness of this road can be expressed as a function of x and x is the position of this vehicle on the road so the roughness is represented by a function ug x we have to derive the equation of motion of this system so this single degree of freedom system is getting a ground displacement ug at each instant as the vehicle is moving over this road this ug changes so this is equivalent to a displacement from the displacement of the support of this single degree of freedom system so let's try to solve this so we have this mass connected to the spring and the damper and it moves with the speed v so when it moves it goes up and down and that roughness is given as ugx the displacement of this mass is represented by the variable ut so that would be the total displacement of this mass and the displacement of this mass relative to the base is ut minus ug so the total displacement minus the displacement of the base now let's draw the free body diagram of this mass so this is the mass so when the mass is moved in this direction there will be restoring force in the opposite direction so we have spring force acting in this direction and damping force acting in this direction and there will be inertia force also in this direction so now let's write the equilibrium equation so that would be inertia force plus spring force plus damping force is equal to zero so what is inertia force 
we have learned that inertia force is equal to mass times the acceleration of the mass that is mass times ut double dot this is the acceleration now let's see the damping force so the damping coefficient is c so damping force would be c multiplied by the velocity of this mass so the velocity would be the velocity relative to the base so that would be ut minus ug dot the spring force would be k multiplied by the relative displacement so that is ut minus ug and that should be equal to zero so now we can rearrange these terms so m ut double dot plus c ut dot plus k ut is equal to take these terms on to the right hand side that would be c ug dot plus k ug and it is given that ug is a function of x and what is x we know that this automobile is moving with a velocity v so what will be the position of this velocity at each instant that will be the velocity multiplied by the time so we can re replace this variable x by vt that is velocity multiplied by time so the right hand side becomes c ug dot vt it's function of vt and k ug vt so v is just a constant so this equation will become c v ug dot it will be a function of t and k v ug t so this is the equation of motion of this system now let's look into some free vibration examples so in the first example we have a wooden block connected to a spring and a bullet is fired into this block the bullet has some mass and velocity this bullet gets embedded into this block we have to find out the resulting motion of the block so what happens when this bullet gets fired into this block so the bullet was traveling with some velocity and it has a mass so when it hits this wooden block the both the masses they will move together with some new velocity so by firing a mass a bullet which has some mass into this wooden block means we are giving some initial velocity to this wooden block we will find out how much is the initial velocity and using that we have to find out the resulting motion of this block so let's see how to solve this so in this question the weight of the block is given weight of the bullet is given the stiffness of the spring and the velocity of the bullet are also given now let's calculate the mass of the block is calculated as the weight which is given divided by gravitational acceleration so we'll get the mass and the mass of the bullet is also found like this weight is given divided by g you get m naught and stiffness is already given so now we have to find out the initial velocity of the block so how will we calculate it we can do that using the conservation of momentum so the momentum of the system before and after the impact should be same so before the impact only the bullet was moving with some velocity v naught so the momentum is equal to m naught v naught and that should be equal to the momentum after impact so after impact this mass gets embedded into it so the total mass will be m plus m naught and it will move with a new velocity 
u dot naught. So we can find out what is that initial velocity. So that would be m naught v naught by the total mass. So if you solve this, you will get the initial velocity. So after the impact, the mass of our system changes. The mass becomes m plus m naught and the stiffness of the spring does not change. It is same as the previous. So we can calculate the natural frequency as root of k by the new mass that is m plus m naught and we just calculated the initial condition in the initial velocity we just calculated initial velocity is this much do this and the initial displacement of the system of the wooden block was zero so the initial displacement is zero so using these two initial conditions we can calculate the resultant motion of the wooden block that is ut is equal to u naught dot by omega n sin omega n t. We know that for this free vibration the response is of the form a cos omega n t plus b sin omega n t and if we use the initial conditions we can find out a and b and a is equal to the initial displacement. Here the initial displacement was 0 so we don't have that cos omega n t term so the total response is equivalent to b that is u naught dot by omega n sin omega n t. So we can substitute these values and write the resultant motion of the block in this format that would be in the unit inches. In the next example we have a packaging with an instrument inside it. So this is an instrument and it is packed in a box and this instrument with this mass m is restrained by springs of total st stiffness k by 2. So there is one string of k by 2 stiffness above this instrument and another one below this instrument. And mass and mass of the instrument and the stiffness of the springs are given and this box this container is accidentally dropped from a height of th 3 feet above the ground so this box was dropped from 3 feet so we have to calculate a few parameter of this system so first Let's calculate the initial displacement and velocity of this system. So, when this mass is supported by the springs, because of the weight, this spring will get compressed a little and this spring will get extended by some amount and that would be proportional to the weight of this mass, weight of this instrument. So how much that deflection would be, the static deflection, that we can calculate by the formula mg, that is the weight of the instrument, divided by the stiffness. So we can calculate that static deflection. So uh, that would be the initial displacement of the system when this gets dropped. So the initial displacement that is u0 is equal to mg by k. We can calculate the value of it. Now what will be the initial velocity? So this package is dropped from a height. So when it was before dropping it had some potential energy. So when it is being dropped that pot potential energy will become converted to kinetic energy. So this will get some velocity. So we have learned in previous courses that that velocity will be equal to minus root 2g h. The potential energy before dropping is mg h 
and that will be converted to kinetic energy so that is half m v square so if we solve it we can find this expression for the velocity so using this value you can calculate the initial velocity so now let's calculate the natural frequency the stiffness is given and the mass is also given so natural frequency is equal to root of k by mass so that is kg by weight so you can calculate this value as well next we will calculate the deformation of this system so you have know the initial conditions we know the natural frequency so you can calculate the displacement as a cos omega nt plus b sin omega t all these values are known so you can substitute and get the expression for the displacement of the instrument and you can calculate the maximum deformation as square root of this term square plus this term square so you can calculate the maximum deformation of the instrument inside the package so if we know the maximum deformation we can also calculate the maximum velocity or even maximum acceleration so let's calculate maximum acceleration so if this is the displacement what is the acceleration if you differentiate it twice you will get acceleration so if you differentiate it twice what will happen you get a similar expression with omega n square also as a coefficient so acceleration maximum acceleration is equal to the maximum displacement multiplied by omega n square we know the value of omega n so we can find the maximum acceleration as well just substitute the value and get the acceleration of the instrument now let's move on to damped free vibration examples the stiffness and damping properties of a mass spring damper system are to be determined by a free vibration test the mass is given as m is equal to 0.1 pound second square per inch in this test the mass is displaced by 1 inch by a hydraulic jack and then suddenly released at the end of the 20 complete cycles the time is 3 seconds and the amplitude is 0.2 inches determine the stiffness and damping coefficients so in this the mass was displaced by 1 inch and then it was released that means the initial displacement to the system is 1 inch and it was just released the mass was just released there was no impact or anything so the initial velocity is zero and we also know the amplitude of the motion at 20 cycles and we also know the time taken for 20 cycles so we can calculate the damping ratio and natural frequencies we learned about logarithmic decrement so what is logarithmic decrement it is the natural logarithm of the ratio of amplitudes at different cycles divided by the number of cycles so this is the logarithmic decrement and the damping ratio theta can be calculated as 1 by 2 pi of logarithmic decrement and this is valid when the damping ratio is very small if the damping ratio is very high we have to consider the square root of 1 minus theta square term as well but if the damping ratio is small we can calculate it like this so here we know 1 by 2 pi j is equal to 20 here 
So we can take J as 20 because we know the information at the first cycle and after 20 cycles. So U1 is equal to our initial displacement because that is the amplitude of the first cycle. And Uj plus 1 is the amplitude after 20 cycles that is given as 0.2. So you can calculate the value of zeta and it is we get it as 0 0.0128 that is 1.28 percentage. So that is very small damping since the damping is very small the assumption that we made here to calculate this zeta is valid. So we assumed that damping is, is small so it is actually small so the assumption is correct. If it was not small then we had to calculate it using the exact formula. So now we can calculate the natural frequency. So to do that we will find out the natural period first. So this system is a mass spring damper system. So it will have a damped natural period. So we can calculate the damped natural period using the time taken for 20 cycles. So it is given that 3 seconds was the time taken for 20 complete cycles. So period is nothing but the time taken for one cycle. So the damped natural period would be 3 by 20 that is 0.15. And we just calculated the damping ratio and found that the damping is very less. So in such cases, we can consider that the natural period is equal to the damped natural period. So the natural period will also be equal to 0.15 seconds. So we can calculate the natural circular frequency omega n that would be 2 pi by Tn. So 2 pi by 0.15 is equal to 41.89. Now we will try to find out the stiffness and the damping coefficients. So the natural frequency square is equal to k by m. So k is equal to omega n square m. So we know the natural frequency, we know the mass, so we can calculate the stiffness. And we know that the critical damping coefficient is equal to 2m omega n. So knowing omega n and the mass, we can calculate the critical damping coefficient. We know that the damping ratio zeta is equal to the damping coefficient divided by the critical damping coefficient. So the damping coefficient will be equal to zeta critical damping coefficient. So you have calculated the zeta already and you can multiply it with the critical damping coefficient. We get the damping coefficient. So in the next problem we have a machine weighing 250 pounds and is mounted on a supporting system consisting of four springs and four dampers. The vertical deflection of the support system under the weight of the machine is measured as 0.8 inches. The dampers are designed to reduce the amplitude of vertical vibration to 1 8th of the initial amplitude after two complete cycles of free vibration. Find the following properties of the system. The undamped natural frequency the damping ratio and the damped natural frequency. Comment on the effect of damping on natural frequency. So it is given the weight of the system and it is also given the deflection of the supporting system under the 
weight. So if you know the weight and the deflection, we can find the stiffness of the supporting system. So the weight is the force acting on the springs. So it is getting deflected because of this force. So the stiffness is the force by deflection. So the weight is 250 pounds. So this would be 250 by the deflection given as 0.8. So we can calculate the stiffness of the system. Weight is given, so we can calculate the mass of the system. So mass is weight by gravitational acceleration. So now we know the mass and the stiffness. So we can calculate the natural frequency of the system, which is equal to square root of k by m. The next thing we have to find out is the damping ratio and it is given the amplitudes of two cycles, right? It is given that the dampers are designed to reduce the amplitude of vertical vibration to one eighth of the initial amplitude. We can calculate the damping ratio using logarithmic decrement. So as we assumed in the previous example, initially we can assume that the damping is small. So we can equate the logarithmic decrement to 2j by theta. This is similar to what we did in the previous problem. And we know that the amplitude becomes 1 eighth after two cycles. So at the first cycle it is u0, after two cycles it is u0 by 8. So, logarithm of 8 is equal to 2 and j is equal to 2 because this amplitude is after 2 cycles and pi theta which gives the value of theta is equal to 0.165 that means 16.5 percent. So, that is very high damping. So, since this damping is very high we cannot make this assumption as the damping is small. So now we will recalculate the value of theta using the exact expression for logarithmic decrement. That is 2j pi theta divided by square root of 1 minus theta square. So from this we can evaluate the value of theta solving this equation. So we get theta is equal to 0.163. If you solve the previous equation, we will get the value of theta. Now, we have to calculate the natural frequency of the damped system. So, that would be equal to omega n, that is the natural frequency, multiplied by square root of 1 minus theta square. So, we can substitute the value of theta here and get the value of omega d. So how omega n is different from omega d? So the theta is not a very small value here. So this term is less than 1. So omega d will be less than omega n. So the damping decreases the natural frequency. So because of the damping, the frequency of the system decreases.